Hello and welcome to episode 110 of Fergo and the Freak. I'm that bloke from Rugby League Project, Andrew Ferguson. You can find me on Twitter at AndrewRLP. Joining me as always is the glorious League Freak. You can find on Twitter at League Freak. How are you going there, mate? I'm going really well. Glorious day today. Um, can't complain. Well, we can always find a way to complain. Yeah. Um, but joining us is a bloke who doesn't complain. He's always happy. Uh, <laughs> from the uh, Chasing Kangaroos and International Rugby League podcast, Michael Carbone. How are you going there, mate? Hey, guys. What's happening? Good to be uh, on podcast number 110. Jesus, you guys get through some podcasts. How did you get? How the fuck have you got to 110 so quickly? What's going on? Um, no sleep and no, <laughs> nothing else to do during the day. No hobbies. Uh, what else? A little bit of OCD thrown in there as well. And... You know, slight addiction to this. Yeah, pretty well, much. We're opinionated pricks here, so yeah. but something keep, something happens. When we want to talk about it. You know, keep keep it going, boys. I reckon you can get to a thousand in twelve months' time. I reckon you can get there. Oh, that's, that's already the plan. We'll have to try. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of doing deeper podcasts, but you got two on the go. Oh well, I had two on the go, so the inter- oh, but I was only doing one at a time. See. So, um, of course, yeah, you mentioned Chasing Kangaroos, which started probably this time last year. Uh, had I only had 40 episodes of that so far. And um, the last six weeks I've been the host of the official International Rugby League podcast, which has been a lot of fun. But last episode of that mini series came out today at the time of recording, Wednesday. And, um, yeah, I'll be back to Chasing Kangaroos probably next week or the week after. I might need a week off. We'll see how we go. How did it come about that you ended up doing the official international one? Because, and I think you're really good at it. Like, there's, I think sometimes when you've got an official one like that, they can sometimes get presenters for it that are a little bit too much like cheerleaders. Where I don't think you're like that. You, you take the same sort of approach to the international one where you will ask questions, you'll talk about what you think should be happening. And, yeah, I, I think you're doing a really good job with it. How did that all come about to into being? Thanks, man. I appreciate that. It's And it's funny that uh, it's all pretty, like, crazy how it's all happened. It's been quite humbling. But uh, I didn't expect this sort of thing to happen in, in 12 months, put it that way. But So I pretty much started chasing kangaroos with two mates. And um, eventually they sort of fell off the radar. They couldn't commit to it like I, I could or they weren't as passionate about it as I was. So I ended up sort of going alone, not too far into the piece. And I ended up having guests on and things like that and speaking to people from developing nations all around the rugby league world. And it it started to build a bit of a following. And I'm not sure exactly when it happened, but it was pretty early on in the piece when um, the media manager for the international, or it was the RLIF back then, contacted me via Facebook, I think. And he said, mate, just letting you know we're listening. Um... And it's a really good podcast. If you need anything, let me know. We can give you any information you want. So that's sort of where it started. And I've had a few conversations here and there. And they asked me if I wanted to be on the um, on the judging panel for this year's Golden Boot, which I obviously accepted. And then um, probably a few months ago, they floated the idea of me hosting their their official podcast. They wanted they wanted to launch the rebrand, the International Rugby League, and. As part of that, they wanted some new types of content and podcasting seemed like the way to go and they liked what I was doing, so they wanted to see if I was keen. And and it's funny what you said about my, my sort of hosting style, that I'm not a cheerleader for them and that that's kind of what they wanted. So they said, look, you don't work for us, so you can ask whatever you like and say whatever you want and that's what we want, you know. So it, it all fit, you know. They didn't – they allowed me to say what I wanted and that's – where we sort of got to and yeah six episodes in it's been a great series and hopefully i get to do it again next year maybe we'll see what happens it's be pretty amazing to be able to um have that much freedom while doing something for the official website did you expect them to be saying you know you can't do this you can't go there you can't talk about this you know and then edit heavily and say you need to censor that bit and take that out and were you expecting them to be like that or I'm not too sure what I was expecting, to be honest with you, but look, they were pretty open and honest from the get-go, and so was I. I was pretty clear with, I was pretty clear that, you know, I was still going to have my opinions, that I wasn't going to be like a puppet, so to speak, and they were happy with that from the get-go, and it never needed to be discussed again. So it was actually, they they were pretty great to deal with, I've got to say. It's amazing. Um, 
one of the things with your podcast that I find pretty incredible is that I always think the best sort of podcasts are ones where you find out things you didn't even know about. How do you track down some of these people? How do you track down some of this information about International Rugby League in places where some people probably have no idea that it's been played before? Um, how do you get that yeah. information? And, like, obviously you're a diehard International Rugby League fan. Um, do you find that difficult to get this information? And, like, you know, have you come across stuff that has surprised you as well? Look, everything surprises me. Well, not so much these days, but, you know, everything surprises me. But I guess it's a combination of two things, and it's um, research, number one, and network or contacts, number two. And as the show has progressed, you know, it started off being heavy on the research, but has now become heavy on the contacts. So people now feed me information. And it started very – I think the first instance of that was – because the thing is, the way I explain it too is I'm lucky that I'm talking about something that I love but that not many other people talk or know about. It's a, it's very much niche, right? If I, if I started an NRL podcast, I probably wouldn't still be going. I would have quit by now because there's no way that any players or coaches or administrators would talk to me because, you know, why would, they want, who, why would anyone listen to, to me? I'm a nobody, you know. They can listen to Matty Johns or, or Phil Gould or whoever they want, right? But when it came to International Rugby League and and in particular some of the developing nations and emerging nations, they really didn't have anyone talking about them the way that I did. So very early on in the piece, I think episode four of Chasing Kangaroos, we had a a major topic where we discussed what was going on in Greece, you know, and you guys have obviously heard a little bit about that and you've spoken a little bit about that on your show. Mm -hmm. But we went in depth and and talked about that in great detail, basically just from little bits and pieces of research that myself and my mate had found. And a couple of days after we released that episode, George Stylianos, so the president of the Greek Rugby League Association, contacted me and said, hey, I heard the show. Well done. Like, you explained it so well. Mm -hmm. And from that point on, it's just been growing. Word has spread and all of a sudden people from the Czech Republic or Wales or the USA or Chile or the Philippines or Vanuatu or Italy or Serbia or Russia, like they, they contact me all the time and say, Hey, just so you know, you know, I had a, a message a few days ago from, from a mate of mine now saying, Hey, we're, we're kicking off rugby league in Nicaragua, the domestic league starting with four teams. These are the teams. Here are some score, like just all this sort of information. So as time has progressed, I haven't needed to research as much because I've got people who want me to help them spread the word, which has been really awesome. And subject matter experts too, because they're coming directly from those countries. So you can just get them on and, and ask them to explain it all too, I guess, which is a, like a double win. Exactly. So it's been pretty cool. And it's, yeah, it's like, like you say, like it's, there's, I'm learning stuff every episode and, you know, um, the listeners are learning as well. So someone made a comment to me not long ago saying that, you know, rugby league fans that listen to Chasing Kangaroos know 90% more about the World of Rugby League than your average rugby league fan. It's probably true, you know, because yeah, there's, there's so much stuff there. And, and, yeah, you guys know, you listen to it. so uh, And I appreciate that too, guys. Um, it's good. Yeah, good to know you guys are listening. So that's awesome. Of course, I, I spend all my time listening to podcasts except for ours. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Well, I don't know how you have time because you guys record so many. But anyway, that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you so, just don't sleep. <laughs> yeah, that's it's very very simple. You just record them at four a.m. in the morning, and then you wake up and get ready for the next one. It's you know, it's quite simple. Um, one of the things you said, and, and people know, I have been probably the biggest champion about destroying the Golden Boot Award, going back yeah. just, you know, 20 years maybe. Yeah. Um, now, And it's not up to you to defend the award. That's the first thing I want to say to listeners. But what yeah, I would right. like, what I, I, I thought that some of the commentary about, oh, you know, Tedesco should have won it was a bit weird because I could understand why he was not involved in the final three. But I, what I would like to ask you is, what was you? How did you vote for um, the players? Like, was it on a three-two-one basis? 
And when it got to the final three, what did you think of the names that were put up at the end? And did like was that the end of your involvement? Just uh, I was going to say betting. I didn't mean betting. P- uh, putting <laughs> the <laughs> putting the names forward for the three, two, one, or however you nominated it, or did you get to be involved in the final vote as well? Yeah, so that's exactly what happened. So it was three, two, one, all the way. <laughs> Um, obviously not every game, so it was the professional sort of standard game. So, you know, we weren't voting on Serbia versus Greece or anything like that. So it was, yeah, you know, everything from from Oceania and all, all those sorts of games. Uh, we voted our three two ones. It was obviously more than just myself. There was, I think, uh, five or six judges on the panel. I'm not 100% sure. I should check the email to see, but... Um, and then once it was all over, or close to finish anyway, when when it was sort of when we, when there was a clear um, field, um, they gave us the the, sh- the shortlist based on those three two one votes, and they asked us to cast a final vote based on that shortlist. So we got down to the final three for the men's and the final two, or, or it was two or three for the women's because Emily Rudge was still in contention until uh, until PNG beat England in that women's game. And we were asked to make our final vote, and then a, a winner was announced based on the, that final vote. And I will say, um, I actually voted for, in the women's. I'll tell you who I voted for. I've got no issue with that. But for the for the women's, my final vote was Jess Surges. Mm-hmm. So I'm glad she won. And that's not because I'm a Dragons fan. No bias there. I think she's had <laughs> a, a wonderful international season. Oh, she's uh, had a brilliant. The, she's, she's been great. And um, for the men, I actually voted for Takeaho. And there was one vote in it. RTS won by one vote, and um, I've no, I've no issue saying that because I, I, I felt, I think you know, Roger is is worthy of the award, and he's he's a great Golden Boot winner. Mm-hmm. But I thought Takeaho just had the edge on him this year, especially considering what Tonga had done to to Great Britain and Australia, and he led most of that this year in particular. So yeah, but that's 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 how it worked. Did I, you? I, I was going to say I, I definitely um, agree with both your votes. There, I was thinking that Tokyo was going to get it. Um, but mostly too because Tonga was successful in their matches at the end of the season, whereas Correct. New Zealand Correct. had struggled against a, a very ordinary English side. Um, so I just thought, yeah, I, I would have given it to him. So I was, at least he was close. That's a good thing. And definitely close. It would have been good to see a Tongan in a front row uh, win the award. But look, you know, who knows? There will always be next year. But I have a feeling next year we're going to see the likes of a Tedesco up there simply because the Kangaroos will probably be playing about five games. And if they can win most of those, and, and, and look, if you're talking best player in the world, it probably is someone like Tedesco. But as we know, this this award is given to the best player at international level. And Teddy just wasn't wasn't up to speed in either of the Kangaroos games this year. Actually, can I, I was just, I just got to butt in quickly. I was just going to say, um, yeah. the year before, they had a, a team of the year, mm. um, which I was involved in the voting process of that. Yeah. Um, and you had to nominate five players for each position. And then it got okay. whittled down to, I think, three for each position, and you put in your final votes from there. Do you know if the IRL are thinking about bringing back the team of the year? Because I think that's a better idea than the Golden Boot. Yeah, team of the year is a good idea. I haven't heard anything just yet. I can ask and find out. I'll, let, I'll, I'll tweet you. I'll let you know. But, no, I haven't heard anything like that this year. Um an idea that I did float with them, and and they seemed receptive of, was having like a silver boot for like a for like a developing nation player of the year. So look, yep. looking at guys like, and this I don't know, if, but if many of your listeners would know many of these players, but guys like Jared Summit, who's who comes out for Malta every time they play, and 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 he's often their best player, or someone like Milos Zogovic, who plays for Serbia, and he's often one of their best players, and they've played more international rugby league games than any other any other nation this year, Serbia has. Yep. So just to reward someone like that, you know, that's helping grow the game in a developing nation. And and it's an idea that's on the table. They they could do it maybe next year. But I think the the issue there might be about defining, you know, how how do we define who is um, who is who could be nominated for such an award? But I think something like that would be good. But look, we we need to celebrate as many of these players to play international rugby league as possible, I think. Um, with the the voting, you said that it was basically only the teams that were involved in 
basically the professional level games. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Did you did you find that a little bit strange being such a big fan of all of the other games and like because uh, there were quite a few of the other games that were actually shown in some capacity. I mean, some of it yeah. was through mobile phone footage, which wasn't great, but uh, like it just seemed weird that there was such a, a lot of the international players who just weren't even looked at for the voting. It, it just seemed a little bit strange. I think it would be in a perfect world, you would look at every single international game played over the 12-month period, no matter which nation, no matter who they're playing, or, or as long as they're sanctioned matches, right? But it is difficult for everyone to see every game the way rugby league is sort of broadcast at the moment. As you say, like, I watched the the Greece-Serbia game, which, you know, um, which was sports flick were not allowed into the stadium with cameras with, <laughs> with 15 minutes to go. And we ended up seeing a recording on on Colin Clayweg, the Red Star Belgrade CEO's mobile phone or one of his mate's phones, you know, and it was very hard to make out who was playing well or who was doing what. So mm -hmm. it is difficult. That's that's international rugby league at the moment. It is difficult. But I think hopefully one day we get to a point where it can, we can, you know, sort of it can be a broader or wider, cast a wider net when it comes to things like the golden boot. But for the time being, I think I think we got the best result at the end of the day. So, yeah. With the international game, like we've seen a lot of things being set up slowly. And it's funny because even five years back, there'd be things that's happening now, which were more just a pipe dream, like a world, world cup of nines and things like that. What yeah. are some of the things you would like to see come into being that maybe are just being talked about a little bit or that are almost rumors and things like that? Is there any sort of competitions that you sort of, look out and think, man, we should have that in the International Rugby League right now? Look, we keep hearing about this 10-year plan, right? And mm -hmm. as International Rugby League fans, we hear about it all the time. And, you know, so we've got our World Cup every four years. We're going to have nines World Cups every four years. And I believe there may be more to it than that. So there may be some more uh, geographic-based nines tournaments which lead to the World Cup now. So that's mm -hmm. definitely on the cards and that's definitely being discussed at the highest levels. Um, but we're looking at every two years... Um, having, um, you know, your Oceania Cups, European Cups, your Middle East Africa Cups, your MIA, MIA and your America's Cups as well. So that's going to be happening every two years. And then there'll be a, a third year where we can have some bilateral tests. And I think that's where the fun can be. So I, I really want to see more of these Oceania Cups, especially the European Cup. I want to see, I want to see England, a strong English side playing in a European Cup against France and Wales and Ireland and Scotland and Italy and nations like that because they're probably going to smack those sides in the short term. But I think in the long term, if they don't start getting their act together in Europe, they're going to be left behind because the Pacific is where it's at at the moment and, and they are getting better and better. And I think in five, ten years' time, rugby league is going to own the Pacific. It's going to definitely be the most popular sport in this region and and. Yeah, look at what happened in Tonga. Like they've they had a public holiday last week because they beat the Australian Kangaroos. Like who would have thought? So yeah. it's um it's very interesting. But I think that the the fun can be in those bilateral tests because we see kangaroo tours and Great Britain Lion tours, whether you agree with it being Great Britain or not. That's that's another story. We'll probably talk about that a little bit tonight. But mm. I wanna see, you know, Jamaica playing like Samoa, and I want to see like Italy playing Serbia, and I want to see France playing England, and I want to see Wales playing Papua New Guinea, and I want to see matches that we're not used to seeing, especially outside of World Cup years. So, look, there's a lot of potential. There's a lot being talked about. There's a lot that's actually in place, and that will happen. And you know, if you told anyone that ten years ago, they would have probably laughed. You know, they wouldn't believe. Yeah. They wouldn't believe that. Jamaica and Greece would be playing Rugby League World Cups, put it that way. No, in the same year that Sonny Boom signed the richest deal with the Toronto Base Club. Like, it's just... Oh, and, they, they, and Tonga beat Australia. It's, I mean, how good is that? All in the same oh, it was week. Incredible. <laughs> it was incredible. I think that that test, probably for excitement, was about the best we saw this year. But the best overall test match we saw was probably that PNG versus Fiji test match. Yeah, which was, was yeah, I mean, that, that was, was great. incredible through the whole thing. Um, one of the, the problems we have right now is that there seems to be 
and you, you brought this up a little bit, me and Andrew talked about this a lot over the last few days. There's a bit of a disconnect between what's happening in the Southern Hemisphere with Rugby League and the Northern Hemisphere. And it's re- we're really starting to see, like, you, can, you could go on a really good run as an international team in the Northern Hemisphere, and, but the reality is that you're quite a way back from maybe mm. a team like even the Cook Islands, who would probably wipe the floor with most European teams, to be honest. Um, is it, Do you think that we need to have some sort of competition in place where competition between those two parts of the world is almost forced so that we don't have a end up in a situation where you've got the haves and the have-nots and it, it's, you know, we're almost uh, so disconnected from one another that, What's going on in the different parts of the world? It's it's like two different sports being run um, parallel almost. Yeah, I, I think as long as the NRL is so far advanced of the Super League, we're going to have that problem. Mm. So the, the NRLs, all the best players play in the NRL, even the best English players play in the NRL. The NRL is opening up pathways in places like Papua New Guinea and Fiji into their into the lower grades and. And we're seeing, like, look at Papua New Guinea. We've got guys like Justin Olam, and mm. next year, uh, Edna Gebi will be playing for South Sydney. So their pathways are opening up. The same sort of thing is going to happen in Fiji. You're going to see more Tongans coming through the NRL. And and as long as the NRL is strong and the Super League is weaker, we're going to have issues. We're going to have issues like that. Europe is going to fall behind. And, and unfortunately, that's just the way it is. And hopefully... You know, the only positive that the only way I could see Super League getting better in the near future is, you know, seeing what Toronto is doing. And if, you know, say if Wigan decides they want to try and sign Owen Farrell from Rugby Union and they start to grow their own players and develop more French players and, and, and players from other nations, their neighbouring countries as well, then it's going to be very hard for the Northern Hemisphere to catch up if they don't do something quickly. But I think the answer could be, again, in state of origin in a way because we've always said the kangaroos have been strong for the last few decades because they play origin, right? And there's no doubt about that. that it's, 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 you know, possibly the best standard of rugby league in the world. And the answer to that always seems to be, well, why don't we have a New Zealand origin, North and South Island, or why don't we have an English origin? Why don't they play War of the Roses and things like that? But the solution doesn't need to be origin for, for England. England just needs to play more games, right? So yeah. if England played if England played France three times a year, like state of origin style, they might beat France fifty nil in every game this year or next year. But it might be forty nil the year after and eventually France would get competitive and they would grow together. And we can start to we can start to do similar things throughout the rest of Europe. And I, I just think I feel like England are always play, they're, 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 they just want to play with Australia and New Zealand all the time. They're like your, yeah. your annoying little little cousin. Like, can I play too? Yes, they, really, they are. They are, you know, Michael. You've nailed they, it. <laughs> <laughs> they, they need to be helping, you know, their neighbours out and, and yeah. building strong competitions of their own, and they need the Super League to be strong. And, and you know, it's easier said than done. But um, as long as the NRL is strong, and maybe the NRL needs to, look, we're gonna, we can say some crazy things. Maybe the NRL needs to, to buy Super League and, and you know, do that's something like crazy. that. That's not crazy. We've, yeah, we've, that, we've yeah, discussed that off air. <laughs> Maybe that's where I've heard it. No, I don't know if you discussed it on um, air or off air. But. Well, one, one other idea I think is, um, and I've said this before heaps of times, I think France needs to have a World Cup that is played entirely in France. I don't know yeah, how I, they make it happen, but I think that needs to happen because... I reckon the people of France would flock to that game and it might be just the absolute shot in the arm that Rogue League in France needs. And if that leads yeah. to France beating England in a couple of tests in the short term, yeah. that yeah. might give the, the, the British the massive kick in the ass it needs to get their game up to speed. Well, well France in France usually play well. You know, mm. They might lose to England by 40, and you know this, but they might lose to England by 40 or 50 away, but at home you know, they play quite well in the south of France and... And despite the side that they sent out here that got shellacked by the Australian under-23s, like, the side that was sent here was pretty much, like, made up of elite one players. Like, that was not the strongest French Correct. side. It's a shame It's a shame they were called France. Like, it should have been a French President's 13 or something yeah, like that. 
Exactly. So that's not the strongest French side, and the strongest French side would be much more competitive. But I, I actually believe that a, a lot of people talk about, you know, the next 2025, how we're missing an opportunity by pro probably not having the World Cup in the USA. But I actually think the next two World Cups, 2020, uh, apart from 2021, obviously, but I think the next two World Cups after that should be in New Zealand and France, one mm. after the other. I just yep. think there's so much potential there. I don't want to see it in Australia every every second time. I don't want to see it in England every second time. I want it to be around. Agree. Yeah, I think there's some opportunities there. So I'd even yeah, be happy if they just went to if they went to New Zealand and just let Tonga, Samoa, um, PNG all play on their own islands. Yeah, but not Australia. Australia has to go over and just play in New Zealand. Everyone else plays in New Zealand except for those islands. That way you can build up those nations as well. Um, oh, I'd love that. I'd buy that for sure. Yeah, and I'd I'd love to see like one of the great ideas I have for the French, uh, you know, a French only World Cup is to take a few games into Spain. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Have you got a, was it Camp No? Camp New? Camp New Going, Barcelona. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Play one or two games there. Oh, jeez, can't tell me that's not a, that's not possible to do. That'll be huge, and they've, there's you know there's a Spanish club called Valencia now mm -hmm. that are trying to get into League One. So you know there's opportunities there as well. So I, I definitely think that that would be awesome. Like if, we're just got to think outside the square a little bit. We got we can't be afraid to try new things because you know that's the only way we're going to be able to build and grow our audience. Especially in the Northern so. Hemisphere. I mean that's that's just something the French were always big on too. I mean they were the ones who created the whole World Cup concept, and they wanted the USA in there back in '54. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, we should reward them and give them a, a full World Cup because they've, they've not had one since probably since then from from memory. Isn't it funny that in 1954 we were trying to build the game in in, in the USA and still in 2019 we're still in probably the same position? Like it's just crazy to think the time that's been wasted. Oh, in, England and without going too much on the history, so like England and Australia got in the way of that. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, it's weird because like. And I've said this before, rugby league in the United States, they've got their own community. Like, I don't think people understand that there are people over there, they've got their own community, they mm -hmm. run their own competition, like they've got a club competition, which is a thing a lot of rugby league playing nations can't say. And if they got like a shred of support, they would do wonderful things with it. And it's cool to see what's happening in Toronto and Ottawa's going to end up coming into Super League at some point. Um, it, like, that club will be starting up very soon. If we get to a point where they do get that New York team up and running and there's some flow-on effects to the United States Rugby League clubs that are already established there, I mean, that's what I want to see from these these teams that are coming into the English competitions is that it's not just a franchise that's set up. It's a, it's almost like a gravity point for the entire game in the, in Canada and the United States where, you know, the local clubs can use that as a recruitment point. Um, they can use the super league clubs or these emerging super league clubs as, you know, a, a rallying point that they can say, look, do you want to have a go in this competition that's played in Europe? This is where you start. You start with us. And I, I hope that it kind of goes down that road rather than it just being a, a pure franchise that is disconnected from the games in those countries. Yeah, I agree. And it's funny, as Australians, we talk about grassroots development as being like the key to building and growing a sport. But in America, in, in the US and Canada, the culture is different. They, mm. they have more of a top-down model, so they need something to aspire to. You look at like the Toronto basketball team, there aren't many Canadians in that team, but they really got behind them last year and they won the, grand the NBA grand final. So that's sort of the criticism that the Wolfpack have got. People are saying, yeah, they're doing great things. They're flying up through the ranks, but there's no Canadians in this side. Well, there's not going to be Canadians in that side for another decade or two at least, but... What's starting to happen now is junior clubs are starting to build around that Toronto area all of a sudden, and they've got development happening. And there's there's a there's a decent competition on the other side of Canada as well in British Columbia, and there's there's things going on. So that's sort of how it needs to work. And and the New York Rugby League side could have that same sort of effect. Of effect. The USARL struggles. You know, it's more of a social competition in my eyes. Like you've got some good players there. And, and some, like, national-level sort of players that come from there domestically. Um, but really, like, 
teams fold and start at the drop of a hat. And we we saw this year that you know clubs like Atlanta um, folded because many of their players were trialling for the new MLR uh, Major League Rugby side in in Atlanta this year. So they struggle with little things like that. But what's really interesting in the US at the moment is the California Rugby League. I'm not sure if you guys have heard too much about that, but basically they've got an exhibition game happening in a couple of weeks' time, and all of a sudden they've got four or five clubs and a and a and a, and a new competition happening on on the West Coast next year. They've got sponsors, they've got awesome jerseys, and they're doing things the American way, which is something that the USARL haven't done before. Um, they're, they're friendly. They're friendly with each other, like they're not they're not fighting or or anything like that, but it just sort of adds a new sort of piece to the American puzzle that mm-hmm. yeah, it's going to be very interesting what's going on there. And especially with the new professional clubs, as you say. Now I have a dream. <laughs> uh, yep. I Careful. have a dream. And <laughs> it's, uh, this speech. <laughs> yeah. no, no, I'm, I made that line up. I, I oh. uh, might need to copyright that. <laughs> but uh, it's of rugby, a rugby league team, an NRL club, based in Honolulu. I think wow. it would be absolutely perfect. It would get the NRL's foot in the door, not only through Pacific Island nations, but into the United States market on some level. Um, the temperature is beautiful. I don't think you'd have any problems getting players to go and live in Hawaii to play rugby league. Have you got something that you have a dream that it's like, man, I would love to see this one day? Oh, man. That, like I've got a few dreams, but go that, for like it. That, Tell us about that, it. That's intent. Look, you start with like USA is the biggest international rugby league fans' dream, right? Because we all want that piece of the puzzle. We all want that to happen, and we all want to see our sport thrive in that country. So I'd love to see even like the NRL investing in that USA competition in some way. Like they just need to throw a couple of million dollars here and there, and and mm-hmm. and help it grow. But I mean, that's a dream, but. Oh, mate, that is a great question, Lee Freak. That is a great question. I guess I want to see. <laughs> this is going to sound really strange. It's it's not. It's a really strange thing, and it's not something I've said out loud. But my my biggest goal for international rugby league is to be able to support the Kangaroos because, mm-hmm. and I know that sounds really weird, but I've never supported the Kangaroos because I've always wanted to see competitive international rugby league. And I want to see other nations doing well. And I've always gone for the underdogs. I've, I've woke as a, as a teenager, I would wake up at two in the morning to watch Great Britain play Australia, hoping that, you know, that the Lions could win or hoping that Stacey Jones would lead the Kiwis to victory. But I've, I think we're getting close. But my dream is to cheer on the Australian kangaroos because they're the underdogs. And I think when we get to that point and – the rugby league world will be a great place. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't know if that's the sort of answer that you were expecting. No, mate, that's. But... <laughs> I must say, I, I I kind of agree with that. Like, I, I find myself watching World Cup games when the World Cup's on, and I don't. I usually find myself going for Papua New Guinea or yeah. France. Yeah. Because I want to see those two teams go well. They've been around longer than most of the other nations, with very little success. I want to see them. You know, kick the curb, go around the corner, and even just to reach a, a World Cup final for either of those two nations would be phenomenal for the game. It would there. be crazy. It would be crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 But, um, but mate, there's so, guys, there's so much. Like, well, you know, I want rugby league to be successful in Wales and Canada, and I love seeing what Jamaica's doing. And, you know, I'm Italian heritage, so I, you know, I'd love to see Italy doing well, but. You know, like it's, there's, I have too many dreams, guys. I've got too many well, dreams. <laughs> should I share the one that I had? And I actually wrote an article about this a few years ago. Yeah, tell me. All right. Do you watch the wrestling at all, WWE? I, uh, yeah, I, no, I, I grew up watching wrestling from Hulk Hogan to The Rock, probably. Ah, so you've heard of the XFL? Yep, <laughs> definitely. Right. Yep. Well, a few years ago, Vince McMahon, owner of the WWE, decided he was going to reboot the XFL and get it back up again. And I yeah. wrote an article saying, instead of doing that, given that it was a financial loss for him last time and made him a bit of a laughing stock, he should invest, instead invest that money in rugby league and create his own extreme football league, but it would be rugby league where there's no pads and no helmets. 
And I think that rugby league over there would fit closer with his WWE product as far as the, the physicality of it. And he's got the money to, and he's got the promotion skills. He's got the links everywhere. He could make that work. You wouldn't need to have 50 teams. You'd only need to have eight, 10 teams. He could make it work. And I just thought that would be absolutely brilliant if you got Vince McMahon to run rugby league in America. I, I think I read that article um, <laughs> now, that, now that you mention it. And I, like we, we definitely need a Vince McMahon. And it's funny you mention that as well because I, I kind of touched on it. But I kind of think the, res, the, the wrestling entertainment industry route is the way that rugby league can grow over there. So we've got – we've mentioned the USARL on the East Coast. You've got – the California Rugby League on the West Coast, you've got guys in Chicago trying to set things up. You've got guys in Texas trying to set things up. And to use your Vince McMahon analogy again, before Vince McMahon, wrestling was sort of broken up into little geographic territories. Mm. And I think Vince McMahon's old man, his dad owned a small piece as well. And when Vince took over, he decided that he was going to take this thing national and then eventually global. And that's what he did. And I kind of think that's, how rugby league can grow in America by having these little geographic pockets, and eventually, a Vince McMahon comes in and says, "No, we're gonna we're gonna make this thing big," and maybe maybe it'll be his son Shane McMahon. Who knows? Who knows? But I think that's that's a cool dream, man. That's awesome. <laughs> we think the, uh, yeah, it'll be interesting. I just wonder <laughs> uh, when they're still in in those regional you know areas, who's going to be the Andy Kaufman? Who decides that he's going to play in the women's <laughs> competitions? The intergender Brave rugby league champion, yeah. No, oh, no, Brave. no, Trent Barrett. <laughs> oh, the, you, Trent you, Barrett you with those eyelashes and the the pecs. Well, it doesn't he get better looking the older he gets? That black, he, what a champion! What a it's, what a great dragons player! It's almost hateful. <laughs> it's, it's the only oh, thing gross. that I can't I can't hate him for is he's, he's a very good looking man. No, he does well. He does well. But, um, yeah, I, <laughs> I didn't expect the topics to get, get to Trent Barrett's look, but awesome. Uh, <laughs> we normally we'll do. Like we find a way to get back to the stuff we talk about is Trent Barrett. <laughs> we find a way to get back to Trent. Yeah. That's all this podcast is. We said, let's do a Trent Barrett podcast. And Andrew was like, no, nah, we can't just make it all about him. And so we said, oh, let's just talk about a few other things and then we'll work Trent into it. Um, so, I yeah. Do that. I still reckon you would have got to 110 episodes talking about Trent Barrett, actually. You definitely would have had the content. Definitely. <laughs> you gave us two full episodes, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you think about the upcoming Ashes series? Because I've got I've got a real worry that Australia is just going to be like a buzzsaw through this English team next year. And it worries me about how the English supporters will how they will start looking at that 2021 World Cup if they're coming off of such a battering at the hands of the Kangaroos. Does that worry you at all? Yeah, it does a little bit after seeing what happened with the Lions. And, and you know, we can call them Great Britain, but let's be honest, they were England, right? It was just England wearing different jerseys. But, like, only a year before that, they were, or two years before that, they were in a World Cup grand final. And... You know, last year they were beating, they beat New Zealand in a series, and I don't know what happened this year. Like they've had injuries, and you know, Burgess has retired, Tommy Mackinson's in, uh, Makinson's injured, and players like that. But I, I don't think, I just don't think the excuses are there, and and I kind of feel like the great, I feel like the Great Britain thing was a mistake. Like I feel like if England came here, it might have been different. They would have been playing for something they believe in because. I'm not I'm not completely aware of the political situation over there. You've got Brexit and all that sort of thing, but I don't know if Great Britain is a is a thing anymore or a, or a brand that people believe in anymore or that people are keen to play for. And and you even see over here like Wayne Bennett the coach, like he he wasn't worried about Great Britain winning, you know, a series against New Zealand. He was worried about you know which halfback's going to play for England at 2021. That's mm. he was like testing testing things and, and trialing things. And obviously it didn't work out for him or, or for the side, but, you know, even commentators over here calling Great Britain, England nine times out of 10 and, 
and you know I've done it myself and I just think Great Britain was the wrong way to go and I'd like to think that in an English jersey it might be a different story and on home so- soil it might be a different story but I just don't know I am a little bit concerned but they need to they need to turn it around and they need to turn it around quickly I'm a little bit of a cynic I think it was just a, a PR thing like they did that it just look- for marketing they did it to sell jerseys. Like, let's yeah. be honest. Like, the jerseys were cool. They probably made a little bit of money. But they, they, they announced the thing in April, which wasn't even enough time for, for enough fans to get some money together to travel over here. Like, if, if they're going to do – if they were going to do it properly, they needed to plan it years in advance and have some sort of, you know, test series the year before between England, Wales, Ireland, and Scotland and, and use that as some sort of trial for – for a great Britain team, like make the jersey worth something, you know, and 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 make bring the passion back, and and but they just they didn't do that. They didn't have the time to do that, and and I think it all just blew up in their face. The biggest, the, the, it was it was it was going to be a shambles from the get go as soon as the Kangaroos decided they weren't going to play, and once that happened, it, the pin should have been pulled from there. See, I, I didn't have a problem with that because as a as an Australian fan who has watched Australia batter Great Britain, you know, for a long, long time now, I, I just didn't need to see it again. And I, I know yeah. that Great Britain could have used a game against Australia, but it's never helped them in the past to improve. And I just think that it just would have been another big loss for them to, to cop. So I didn't have a... I, I think that we need to get away from looking international rugby league and saying, well... If Australia and Great Britain and New Zealand aren't involved, then it's not really worth doing. Like I yeah, feel I as though, yeah, you know, I feel as though, and I felt like that was a positive thing that Australia wasn't involved in it on some level. But um, I can understand other people feel differently. Look, in hindsight, it was a good thing because who knows what the kangaroos would have done to them? Um, it could have been embarrassing, or even more embarrassing. Like, does it get even more embarrassing than it was? Like they didn't even win a game; they got shellacked by Papua New Guinea. And no disrespect to Papua New Guinea, they played excellent and they deserve it, mm. you know. But it's it's it just goes to show, you know, are, are we seeing are we seeing, you know, a decline for Great Britain and English rugby league, or are we just seeing a, a, a like a surge in the Pacific rugby league? Because like Papua New Guinea, Tonga, maybe even for, like Fiji could have beat that Great Britain side as well. And it doesn't mean it doesn't mean they're that bad. It just means maybe these other guys are that much better now. I don't it's, know. I don't know. It's, a bit, it's a bit of both. It's a bit of both. Yeah. There's a decline in England. It's been going on for four decades. And um, <clears throat> many people will argue with us over that and have done. But, I mean, I've, pro- I've produced some stats which prove it. Um, but, yeah, there's also been quite a, a good increase in, in the Pacific region. And I put it down to mostly from when Auckland Warriors got introduced into the NRL. It sort of yeah. opened the door to the whole Pacific region and, and getting another pathway for them into the NRL. And it's just sort of dragged all of those other nations up instead of Australia waiting and just going and flogging everyone. Everyone else has come up to meet Australia's level. And now we've got Tonga beating Australia. We've got, you know, the Pacific Islands are now beating Great Britain. It's It's brilliant. The, the oh, yeah. Warriors, you're exactly right. What the what we did with the Warriors was open up some pathways, and the NRL is doing it again with the PNG Hunter, and they're doing it again with the Cavite Silk Tails in Fiji next year. That's going to start as well. And that's where, I guess, Super League made a mistake because they did a very similar thing by introducing the Catalan Dragons um, in France. But instead of seeing pathways open up for French players to come through to the Super League, it's happened to a degree. Like we see guys like Theo Fargs playing for St. Helens, but we're not seeing enough of it or nowhere near the level that we saw when the Warriors came in. Like all of a sudden, more than half of the NRL players are, are you know, part of Ireland, like Polynesian, Melanesian descent, which is awesome. And, and yeah, they, they made a mistake there, I think, in the Super League. I think too much that. of what, I was going to say, I think too much of what England's been doing is focusing heavily on, for some reason, Wales. I mean, yeah. we've seen so many teams tried and tried again in Wales, and they just they're just not competitive enough. They're just not there, and yet we've still got what two or three teams in in the lower grades that are Welsh, and they're all in I think League One Championship, and they just don't look like they're ever going to move from there. They need to think further aside than just Great Britain. 
yeah, definitely. Look, there's so many nations there in Europe that they can drive to. Like they should be, they should have been doing more. But like we said, we, it comes back to this, but they they just want to play with Australia and New Zealand. They're the little annoying cousin. And as long as they keep doing that, there's always going to be issues. They're always going to be behind. Even even their style of play. They're trying to play an Australian brand of rugby league. Just play, play it their way. Like you watch the Super League and... You know, we've said that like the NRL is a much higher standard than the Super League. I don't think anyone would argue with that. But the Super League is an entertaining brand of rugby league to watch. Like it's it it's a little bit more off the cuff. There's there's some good open play, and you know, why don't the English side play like that? Maybe because half their players play play in the NRL now, and that's the other thing too. Like Super League, are, you know, they they've got they've got like salary cap dispensations. Like they can. They've got little loopholes where they can sign marquee players and things like that. Like, why aren't they signing the best English players? Why are they letting them come to the NRL? I just think, you know, there's so many issues over there that you guys probably talk about every every couple of days on your podcast, but you could probably fill a few hours worth, worth of discussion. <laughs> yeah, we plan to. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the problems... Like- we- Sorry, yeah, go sorry, on. Sorry, go ahead. No, 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 you go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. What, one of the problems we are having in international rugby league is the performance or non-performance of the Samoan team. Um, yeah. The t- talent is not an issue with the Samoan side. Um, they're playing games regularly, so that's not the issue. Um, there's a lot of calls for a new coach. Uh, Matt Parrish is... You know, his performances, you just got to look at his record. They've been absolutely abysmal. We saw the Tongan players stand up and demand more of their governing body. Um, Do you feel like we might get to a point where we see something similar with the Samoan team with demands of like, and and to to a certain extent we've seen a little bit with France as well, where they just demand more professionalism out of the governing body, um, changes to the way the team is run and things like that. Um, because, I mean, Samoa should be right there with Tonga and Fiji. Yeah, they should be. I agree. And I think I think we are going to see more and more of that. Now, we've seen it in Tonga. We've seen it in Lebanon. We've seen it in France this year. And we're going to see more and more of that because the standard of rugby league on the field for some of these nations has improved out of sight overnight. But the standard of administration has remained the same. Like, like a lot of these smaller nations... They've got, you know, either amateurs or volunteers running the game. Mm. You look at you look at Tonga. You know, they, they, it's the organ, they, their administration, their amateurs and volunteers. But all of a sudden, they had a world class rugby league team on the field out of nowhere because because Taumalolo and Fafita, you know, decided to change allegiances for for you know some interesting reasons as well. But th- they all, and that's going to happen more and more. And we're going to see that the administration needs to keep up. And I think it's, I actually think the Tongan situation is probably a good thing. The players are demanding more. They, they want, they want Tongan rugby league to be at the same level as, as the T1 nations. And, and they're demanding that of their, of their, of their administrators. I think it's good. And we're bound to see more of it as nations get better. Samoa are interesting because they've, they've had that potential. And, um, but I just don't know what the answer is there. It could be the coach. Like they, like you, you look at the respect that Tonga have for Christian Wolf. Mm-hmm. They, they, they take a bullet for that guy. Whereas no disrespect to Matt Parrish, but I just don't know if he's quite up to that standard, you know? And they, yeah. I think they've got, I think they've got Jeff Tuvey on, on as an assistant coach now. Maybe, maybe they need someone like him who's coached at NRL level. But the interesting thing for Tonga is going to be 2021 World Cup when I think, and and don't quote me on this, but I have a good feeling that unless he's injured, Sonny Bill Williams might be retiring in a top, in a in a Samoan jersey at that World Cup. So that might be what turns it around for them. Yeah, and no, like uh, the other th- the thing that worries me about Samoa too is too many times we're seeing them turn up and they're just not up to they're not up to the level you expect, even fitness wise. Mm-hmm. And we used to see that problem with New Zealand, right? Not too long ago. They'd show up for 60 minutes and then, you know, they get thrashed in the last 20. And I, I don't know. I just, I, I I don't know what the answer is with Samoa. Like they should be, they should be toe-to-toe with Tonga, but they're not. 
and and they're falling behind as well. But but um, yeah, I'm not too sure. I'm not too sure. Um, we've talked a bit about the World Cup. Yeah, I was going to say, what would what do you think would be an absolute dream new location for a World Cup somewhere where we haven't taken a World Cup to before, but would actually help rugby league internationally? You guys are asking some great questions. Like, there's the obvious one. You know, you're looking at the Americas. Um, I think somewhere dream location like. There's a lot of money in the Middle East. You know, there's there's places there that we could do some interesting things. Um, places in Europe like like Turkey, like Turkey's growing very quickly, rugby league wise. I don't know if you expected me to say that one, but um, <laughs> it, it might be difficult at the moment given the current climate over there. But you know, politically, but who knows? But um, it's hard to go past the US. And, and, and Canada maybe at the moment as well. It's really hard to go past that. I know that's a boring answer, boys. I don't know if you expected no, that, but I was, I it's, was it's, gonna, yeah, it's hard to. I was probably going to throw up what something it, like Japan based on how the Rugby Union World Cup went. And I, there's I just money there. I just don't want to be seen as following or copying Rugby Union. Like I just, I, yeah. I, we talk, we compare the sports a lot. But I think we've got to. I think as a sport, we've got to sort of forget about that. Stop worrying about what rugby union does. Do our own thing because let's be honest, the product on the field, for, as for like rugby league, is a much better product on the field. We might be biased, but it's much better than rugby union. Like I tried to watch that rugby union World Cup final after the Australian Tonga game, and I was on my phone the whole time, you know, answering DMs from people who were excited that Tonga beat Australia. I looked up and there was like six penalty goals and no tries in this rugby yeah. world cup. Like it was just terrible. And uh, you know, we shouldn't wipe like, look, we shouldn't be worried about what rugby union is doing all the time. Let's do our own thing. Let's grow our sport. There's room for both, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. But look, oh, I wasn't really um, doing it in a, a rugby union thing, thinking more about new markets and, and places mm. where there's money. So I was thinking like Japan, China, India, yeah. you know, there are all these um, big regions with lots of money. And there's, you know, we've got, we do have a team in Japan. They don't play anywhere near enough football to warrant having a World Cup, that's for sure. Um, and India's only just recently started playing international footy. But, you know, yeah, just somewhere completely different, brand new market we've never looked at before. And, you know, who knows how it would go. I mean, India pretty much just has cricket and kabaddi and, occasionally soccer that they sort of get into. Yeah, I think there's, yeah. there's potential there for rugby league to, to really take off there down the line. There's potential for rugby league everywhere. Let's be honest. Like it's, you know, we, we love it for a reason. Yeah. And um, like we said, yeah, India, like the jungle cats, you know, they've had a couple of good games this year. They're undefeated two two from two and oh. So, you know, they're, they're doing great things. Oh, are they, did they win their last game? I think they did. You might, yeah, you think, might know more, I, Andrew. I think I <laughs> but and I think we're going to see China take part in a in a Samoan Nines. I heard last year as well, uh, next year as well. So look, you never know. There's potential in places like that. But like that, that's a dream. Like you got to look at the big economic world powers, right? That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah it's uh, and that Samoan Nines will be really interesting. That that kind of come out of nowhere, didn't that? Was uh, interesting news. Um, sorry, go on. Yeah, I haven't heard a lot about it apart from, you know, a couple of articles here and there. So I, I'm not sure where it came from, but it's I'll definitely be watching with interest. Yeah, so anyway, Michael, tell us where we can find you and <laughs> basically anything you want to plug right now, now's the time to do it. So <laughs> go for it. Oh, guys, well, look, just Chasing Kangaroos, Facebook, Twitter or Instagram, check it out. Um, give us a follow. Happy to answer any questions or chat about anything International Rugby League. So, yeah, give us a follow. Uh, the podcast is called Chasing Kangaroos. Uh, you can find it anywhere as well. Probably wherever you're listening to this podcast, you can find Chasing Kangaroos. And the last six episodes were the International Rugby League podcast. So I just had a chat um, yesterday, uh, two days ago, actually. It was released today, Wednesday, with Nigel Wood, the CEO of the International Rugby League, asked him a bunch of questions. Not sure if you guys have listened to that yet. Yeah, listen to it. It was a good one. It was inter interesting to hear some of the things he was talking about in that one. So 
Um, and I haven't heard it talked about anywhere else. So, yeah, people should go and have a listen to that one for sure. One thing I will say, actually, just before that, yeah. just quickly, is you yeah. asked the you asked the fans on Twitter to put in some questions, and usually, yeah. usually that's fraught with danger. Um, as we've found, whenever we've seen the Ask Kenty <laughs> questions on NRL three hundred and sixty or Twitter, <laughs> but yeah. I was looking through the questions that had been asked, and there were some genuinely brilliant questions being put forward, and I thought there's no way you're going to be able to ask these because he's going to need to prepare prepare an answer for them. Um, how did you get around a lot of that? I look. I was worried as well because I thought, will he answer all of these questions? Um, and I basically needed a sh- before the interview. I got assurance from him that he would answer any any um, any international rugby league related question that I had for him. Mm-hmm. And and luckily, he was very open, very honest about it, which I think surprised a few people that have listened so far. So. Mm. Yeah, it, like I, I think it was probably the best episode yet, simply because where else do we get to hear a guy like Nigel Wood speaking about these sort of things so candidly? Exactly. So yeah, sorry, give give myself a shameless plug, but yeah, I, I enjoyed it. So. That was brilliant. Yeah. It was really, really good. I was, I was really impressed with how you handled it, to be honest. So, um, and yeah, I, I think that that was, as you said, probably the best one you've done. Oh, thanks, mate. I appreciate that. I've had some had a lot of fun along the way, and um, yeah, I just want to say thank you guys for what you're doing as well. Like, just it's good to have a, a rugby league podcast in the off season to listen to. So keep it up, keep keep pumping them out, and get to the thousand in the next twelve months. <laughs> but um, and and thanks for thanks for having a chat with me because I'm used to um I'm used to being the guy asking the questions, not the guy answering questions. So this has certainly been pretty cool for me and pretty different for me as well. So. Yeah, thanks, Eves boys. That's awesome. Well, thanks for joining us. Yeah, and uh, anytime you want to come back on, we'll probably talk to you again in the next couple of weeks too because, you know, we're always tossing around things that we'd like to talk about and the vast majority of it has to do with International Rugby League, funnily enough. So it's cool to get a new voice in and have a new guest on and, like, uh, you know, we've got some really good followers that tend to follow a lot of stuff that we bring up. So I'd encourage everyone to, to you know, get online and start following Chasing Kangaroos on Twitter and, and Facebook and all that. And, yeah, get involved in the conversation because the more people talking about International Rugby League, the bigger it will become. I appreciate that, man. And, um, yeah, happy to come on and chat to you boys anytime. Cheers. Well, you can catch... Uh... You can you can catch myself on Twitter at Andrew P League Freak at League Freak Michael. You can catch that Chasing Ruse Pod on Twitter. Um, thanks for dropping in, mate, and um, we'll wrap this one up. Tune in um, in about three hours' time. We'll put out another two or three episodes. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, boys. Cheers.